I'm glad that I can edit all of this, so we're not we're not beholden to any of the uh, any of the video. All right, welcome to the Frequencies podcast. My name is Jonah Dempsey, and I'm joined by Chetan Parkin, who is an incredible um, human design analyst, writer, um, really one of my first introductions. No, not? I object to the word analyst. Okay, okay. So people that poke things up your rear end, you know, it's like, no. <laughs> welcome to the Frequencies podcast. I've got to see, I'm, I'm a little discombobulated. I thought here. Welcome to the Frequencies Podcast. I am your host, Jonah Dempsey. I'm joined today by Chetan Parkin, who is a human design practitioner, author of many books, and uh, was really one, one of my early introductions to human design. Um, we met briefly in 2017, 2018, which was really exciting for me. I think that was, you were the first human design professional that that I, I met. And I remember being kind of thrilled to meet you. I was very deep in my um, experiment as a generator. So I, I really took it so literally not not to initiate that I was just, I remember I didn't say anything. I stood there, I was basically a wooden board. I'm like, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to just going to stand here. And I, I think a couple of days went by like that. And then finally, something happened. And we ended up having a conversation. But it was, um, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. And that was at the United Astrological Conference, which um, we were kind of human design plants in the, uh, we were, we were spies for human design in the, in the astrological den of lions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of us there. Not a lot of us there. So, um, so I remember in our conversations, I was so intrigued because one thing that I was really drawn drawn to you was that you really have a a larger mystical context that set you on your journey to human design. And you know, I, maybe you could you could kind of tell tell our uh, listeners a little bit about what brought you on that journey. But I remember in our conversation, you actually said that you were prophesied to be involved in this system. I think it was in 1979, you were told that you would be involved. And that that really captured me because so many people in human design are kind of so excited to discover something that allows them to throw away everything else. But I actually <laughs> think, I actually think the larger mystical context or even just the larger context of life, I mean, let alone mysticism is, is relevant. And it's so intriguing to me to be, um, Kind of to have been a, a a seeker and then to have been told years in advance that you would play this pivotal role in in the human design system. Yeah, I had a funny story with old Jonah. Um, I qualified as a mechanical engineer and I traveled all over the world troubleshooting stuff. And I ended up actually driving buses backwards and forwards from London to Kathmandu, magic bus and $60 one way, 43 seater bus. And I found in the very first trip I did, half the people on the bus, so this was pre-internet, you know, there'd be a little sign on a cafe notice board somewhere, you know, bus going to Nepal, such and such a time. So literally I would drive up to a cafe, people would jump out, throw their bags in or, oh, you're going to India? You know, I haven't got any luggage, let me on board. You know, it was just crazy stuff in those days. And, you know, going through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan to India, and then up to Nepal. But that very first trip I did, half the passengers were going to Osho, who was in those days called Rajneesh. And this guy was really something. But uh, it took me a little time before I actually managed to make my way there and become part of his community. And I lived with Osho for about 11 years in India, in Oregon, back in India again. And he is an enlightened master, like really, truly a spiritual master, a mystic and uh, brilliant orator, the most published man of all time. He read more books than any human being has ever read. I used to work in his library. I mean, it was incredible what he had in there. And everyone would ask him, why are you write, reading all this stuff? And he says, well, you know, I talk to you every day. I've got to find something to talk about. <laughs> so, you know, really 
an amazing presence. And then he passed away in 1990 and I left. But 1979, when I first got into his community, there were thousands of people there. You know, it was basically a hippie conference. Like people came from all over the world. It was better represented than the United Nations. Mm. And uh, everyone would be asking questions. You know, what about this? What about that? And I was so shy, I wouldn't ask anybody anything. And he said, you know, if you're really shy, but you have a lot of questions about yourself, go and visit this man in Bombay, now Mumbai, and he'll tell you everything. And you'll never need to ask me another question. So I took him up on that. So I went down, caught the train down to Mumbai, got a taxi. We were going round and round and round circles because, you know, trying to find somewhere in Mumbai pre-GPS or anything else for that matter. It was a chaos. But finally, I saw the building that I was trying to get to. And I literally jumped out of the taxi and ran, jumped over barriers, fences, whatever, and got to the front door, knocked on the door. And the guy comes down and he says, oh, great. I was, I was expecting you. Well, I hadn't made any reservation I was aware of, but this is India, you know, different things happen. And he says, you're just in time. If you'd come a little bit later, I wouldn't be able to read for you because it has to be at a certain time of day that I can do the measurement. And the measurement I need is the length of your shadow. Mm. Well, I just jumped across a whole bunch of stuff. I wasn't paying particular attention, but his son had this funny looking stick with colors on it. Sticks it up against my heel and then makes readings or measurements. This, this, I have no idea what he's measuring. It wasn't a ruler of any kind I'd ever seen. Anyway, back upstairs. The father asked me for date of birth, time of birth, place of birth. He does the astrology for that, Vedic astrology. He then asked for my full name. He does the numerology for that. So he's got these three triangulations. And from that, behind his desk, he's got these hundreds of books all look identical to me, but he goes to one book, well, pulls out the book, opens up to a page, and it's my page. Apparently, this thing was recorded somewhere between two and 3,000 years ago. We're talking very different astrology system. However, it was recorded, whatever was written down there, it was written in some language, I have no idea what it was. But anyway, he, he reads me. Thousand lifetimes ago, this hundred lifetimes ago, that last week, this week, next week, day you become enlightened, day you die, you know, da 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 da. Mm. And I'm standing there, I'm 20, 27, 28 years old, and my hair is standing on him. How on earth, starting a thousand lifetimes ago, whatever, how on earth does he keep hitting the notes? You know how it is when somebody tells you something and it's exactly right, it's exactly in tune with you. And he kept on doing this throughout. Anyway, he gets the end of the reading, closes the book, and says, I want you to come and work with me because you know how to do this work. Really? I know how to do this work? So I'm sitting there. You know, human design had not come into my life. I'm emotionally defined, you know. Sit with it, sit with it, sit with it before you make a decision, you know, from get clear in your belly. And I, you know, I'm off in my head. It's like, what on earth did he just ask me here? And I, after about 30 seconds, I turn him down. I said, there's no way I can work with you. you know, I've, I've got other things going on in my life. He cracked up laughing like I told him a really, really good joke because in that moment in time, he saw there was a fork in the road for me, a distinct fork. If I had been a little bit more mature and realized a world expert was informing him about something I probably worked on several hundred lifetimes ago, you know, in some way, if, mm -hmm. I'd, if I'd tuned into that, I'd been living in India and living a very, very different life. But as it was, when I turned him down and he finished laughing, he said, it doesn't matter because you're going to do this work anyhow. And he says, my advice to you is get ready. Learn or remind yourself how to read for people. Find a system you can work with where you can tell people about themselves because there's a new system that's going to come into your life. You're going to write books about it. You're going to introduce it all over the world. It's going to change people's lives forever. Well, this was 1979. It was about December 1979. I went out of there. My head was spinning. I, you know, so really. But he'd made the impression, you know, there was everything he'd told me about myself was so accurate. And so sure enough, you know, within days from that time, I was introduced to reading hands. I started practicing reading hands. I got into tarot. I got into the I Ching. I got into astrology. I got into auras, tea leaves, coffee grinds, 
any way in which you can look at something or experience something and inform somebody what it is you see. And apparently I had a knack for it. Apparently it was just something that was really easy for me and learning what you can say and what you can't say. You know, how to be neutral in delivering what is very evident about somebody else's life journey. Mm -hmm. And so sure enough, 1993, this old girlfriend of mine sends me a chart. And she says, I've got this guy coming from Europe and he's got this new system. And I thought you'd be interested. Well, <laughs> I take one look at my human design charts like, oh my God, this is it. This is the system. Mm -hmm. So literally I was living in Maui at the time, every year, twice a year, whatever it took. I even had to sell my Maui cruiser one time to be able to afford to make the trip to Taos, New Mexico, to, dis to study every time Ra came to town. Seven years of that. And right at the very beginning, you know, this was the time when, yes, this thing is based on neutrinos. Well, you know, what are neutrinos? Well, nobody knows. They're just a theory. And the whole system's based on this theory business. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we'd go, kind of go along trusting, you know, and I'd go home back to Maui again. And people would ask me, you know, where have you been? And, you know, I, oh, I got this new system. Let me show. Oh, I'm not really interested. You know, don't, I don't need another system. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I was literally talking to myself, learning for myself, you know, writing my notes drawing up charts using an astrology program, you know, conscious and unconscious or personality design, and literally um, teaching myself, you know, getting the notes in class, coming back with wadges of notes from the classes, because Ra was a good talker. He'd light up, you know, and just talk. And uh, some of the yeah. stuff, you know, round the block 20 times before he came back and nailed something or kind of indicated what it was he was really talking about. Amazing stuff. I mean, it was really pioneering stuff because he didn't know that it could be proven scientifically. You know, he didn't know if the thing worked. He was trying it out with us. And sure enough, you know, you know Ra's design. He's somebody that has, says something and then somebody explains to him what he just said. That's what was going on in the early days. And fortunately, my old girlfriend, Zeno, and her new husband, Chaitanya, they were both projectors. And they both would sit there and listen to him talking and talking and talking. And then they'd tell him, well, this is what you've done. This is what this is. Here's the system. Here's how it works. They literally built the human design system. And um, that was it with me for seven years. I qualified as a teacher in, with Ra in 1997. And I've been teaching ever since. First book came out in 2009. By that time, Ra and I had parted company and, uh, you know, basically I was blacklisted by the whole human design community. What does he think he's doing, you know, writing a book? <laughs> it's like, well, you know, somebody's got to put this in really simple terms for everybody in a way that any public individual can find out how important the system is and how it works for them. So, yeah, here I am 30 years later and uh, every day of my life, it's human design and every reading i mean thousands upon thousands of readings i've done all over the world now and uh, every reading is an education for me every single person i meet you know it's like how do i phrase this particular thing in a way that they're going to get it how do i use the right tone of voice so that it's going to resonate with them and it's just you know it's like i don't know i call myself a glorified piano tune you know Everybody's been so conditioned in their lives, but they recognize human design when you say it in a way that reacquaints them with their own frequency. And just as you called your podcast frequencies, you know, you absolutely got it. It's what it's all about. It's all about frequencies. We got 14 numbers on the right, 14 numbers on the left. We got a star field putting out its music, comes into our solar system, blasts through a planet, adds a little extra tone to it and then logs in our genes, starfield planet gene. And so we end up with these unique frequencies. And the whole thing is, all right, what's your type? Well, it's, you know, if I'm a generator, I've got this little thing inside me that goes, oh, you know, something matched my frequency. If I'm a projector, it's like, oh, that's, that's kind of a familiar sensation, you know, whatever's coming at me now, I seem to be called to it. If you're a manifesto, you just have to know, you know, there's something available inside me that can interact in the world somehow. And if you're a, a reflector, you know, you're here for the ride. Mm -hmm. 
my so, my mother my mother is a reflector and i actually received my first human design reading from a reflector and it's been interesting in my journey how i've it's like like you said how you, you know we we are learning every reading you're still learning you're tweaking you're adjusting um yeah i mean going going back to my childhood and understanding there's so much um i love human design because it gives us such a rich vocabulary and it gives us these buckets to categorize experience and then we kind of go back and go oh actually i had been attributing this to type and actually it's nothing to do with type and actually it's nothing to do with it's it's kind of it's a gift that keeps on giving because it's not it, it's giving us formulas but it's not really um replacing the lived life experience it's giving us an ability to to understand and talk about that experience and then to continue to flesh it out and deconstruct it and turn the rock tumbler in different ways and see what gems fall out this time and it's really um it's been it's been interesting for me just just with reflectors it was about two years ago that i had a real breakthrough in my understanding and it was at the high desert human design conference which is an event we put on here in in santa fe new mexico and we had seven reflectors and we were doing interesting aura experiments where we would put the reflectors in the middle of the room and put generators on one side and we were just having a lot of fun with it and i started to um it's hard to even put into words what the understanding was, but I started to know certain things about the reflector that I hadn't known. And one of the things that that came to me was essentially this understanding of the harmony of the spheres, like we're like we're, we're talking about, the frequencies of the planets and so on, and how the a really clean frequency from a reflector can be like a symphony of planets and it can actually be rapturous and fill the others with a sense of surprise it's not just that the surprise is their signature but the others can be surprised at what's going on and it's like this kind of aura just permeates the room especially when you have seven reflectors who are all deep in human design and who have been surrendering and are you know i was joking it was like being at uh, chernobyl or something because there were so few of us compared to them that there weren't enough bodies to absorb all of the neutrinos coming from them and so on or coming through them. But uh, it was a really wonderful experience. I, I still haven't fully put it into words, but I started to appreciate, I started to appreciate something that a lot of people coming into human design, I think are relieved to get rid of, but, but we never really get rid of, which is spirit and it's not something that should be gotten rid of i think we, we we need to shed a lot of false spiritualism but the notion of spirit is actually something that does need to be understood and appreciated not in some abstract conceptual way but just the despairing spirit or the hopeful spirit the generous spirit versus the greedy spirit the you know just in the sense that what my my, my human design journey has very much been from basically starting my life mired in spirituality that I eschewed because it was California school of sunshine spirituality, right? And kind of being, you know, oh, I'm not going to fall for any of that, you know, kind of attitude to essentially going through a deep uh, exploration. I first encountered human design in 2006, and I actually dismissed it as too um not too far-fetched i misunderstood it as too positive too love and light too much uh, of that which of course it's not it's not it's it's very mechanical and it's very um but for a long time i i just thought no i'm doing the real thing you know i'm studying archetypes and i'm studying carl jung and i'm studying there was something some kind of some kind of academic uh thing that i was going for but I always was very interested in what, what you would call the, the, the matters of the spirit. And then coming into human design, really bringing me um, on a journey of, of getting rid of and shedding almost everything only to rediscover it with fresh eyes. It's kind of like you can't really get away from what's there in the world. You can only re return to it without all of the baggage of all of the assumptions and so on. So I just wanted to say, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about you um, is that 
from what I what I know, what I've seen of your posts and so on, you you do exist in a greater context than human design. I mean, on one hand, right, human design is a big part of your life. It is your life. But I saw a thread the other day talking about Osho. And I mean, Osho was a great spiritual leader. He was incredibly ahead of his time. I mean, and there are others and there are many. And and I see a lot of people coming into human design who are are it's probably necessary for them to be resistant to anything else so that they can get it in its purity. But at the same time, um, yeah, my, my journey has been from really becoming such a human design purist, getting rid of everything else, and then looking back at everything that I got rid of and kind of noticing how it is all part of the same tapestry. And there is there is a mystical tradition. I mean, human design is the most recent mystical revelation of a tradition that probably goes back to Mesopotamia and before. I mean, this is a, a very interesting um, time to be the, in the world. Yeah. I think this is the only civilization that's been here in Mesopotamia. We're on about the fourth or fifth time of coming to this place where humanity either takes a jump or it crashes. Hmm. Every 6,000 years, the same thing, repeat, repeat, repeat. We've been here before. And the great hope is this time we do something different. What you're talking about, you know, the academia and the kind of Carl Jung and all that stuff, you know, it's all collective. Mm -hmm. It's all collective stuff. We're moving out of the age of the collective. Hence, all these systems are falling to pieces. You know, the politics, the banking, the religions, all of it's falling in pieces. We're moving into the age of the individual. And so to me, human design is the exact tool for these times. You know, you can find out what the heck's going on in your design. You talk about reflectors. I have a great uh, friend, a reflector. He became fully enlightened about three years ago. That basically means when they put sensors on his brain, they can, he can flatline, no thought, no mind. So I've known him for years before he became enlightened. I was around him while he was becoming enlightened and I've been around him since. A reflector, right? So somebody that's here for the ride, you know, like you described, there's an extraordinary reflection that comes through them. It's pure love, you know, no non-judgmental love in simple terms. But I, you know, I asked him, you know, what, what was the difference between, you know, before you got enlightened and now? And he just turns to me and says, well, nothing bothers me anymore. Yeah sense you know that's the watchword for realizing you've actually come to a place of true understanding about life that this is you this life is you there's no separation you know it's like yeah we play all our roles and stuff and but once once you really come to terms with with life you are the life this is you this is your movie your universe whatever you want to say about it so yeah it's an absolute fascinating time for all of us and yeah, there, there really is this thing of, um, I lived in a spiritual environment for years and years around Osho. I mean, the guy was incredible. It was like living in a nuclear reactor. It was insane. And um, so much fun. So much transformation taking place around him. The guy was just a genius talker. And then, you know, I had to listen to Ra for seven years. And... <laughs> There was a difference. There was a distinct difference, you know, between hearing somebody that got a message like Muhammad, you know, and somebody that actually was eloquent and coming from a place of absolute and pure love while everything was being explained. And that's why, in a sense, Ra and I parted company after about seven years. I couldn't hack it anymore. It was, it was just, um, I'm very glad to say that after my departure, you know, he had this son born to him, Loki. And uh, Loki was actually a reincarnation from one of Osho's disciples who became enlightened in his last days. And um, Ra's whole temperament changed. And Loki really managed to get him to say, come on, chill, you can be really loving with your classes, be more confident in yourself. I mean, he had 10 first lines, Ra did, which allowed him to withstand the download Physically, his body could handle it, but he know, you know, it totally shattered his understanding about life or his confidence in himself. So, you know, to me, hats off, Ra. I mean, how the heck did you pull that thing off? You know, 
how did you manage it? And then all the things that happened along the way, he, all he wanted to do was earn a crust, you know, make a living, you know, he had this amazing system and one thing after the other just collapsed around him. And um, in the end, you know, he, he took on some of my ex-students as business managers and stuff and he pulled the whole business together. And uh, I think by the time he left, you know, he'd made a small fortune and, can, you know, the whole business continues to make a small fortune. But I was not going to be able to go that way with him. I had to part company with him. Well, and he had um, he had a third line. I, I, I think I can't remember both the nodes, but third line nodes. I have third line nodes, and I, I just did a deep study of the nodes. I mean, it's one of my favorite topics. I kind of uh, return to it every year or so. There's some some cycle in my life where I come back to the nodes, but I really think you could do a whole characterization of the road people travel just based on their their nodes really that the nodes say so much about a person's life and the third line i i which i have on both personality and design um, is absolutely the the life of constant turmoil and financial difficulty and yeah i i know a little bit about um Ra's finances at the end, and while he was a fifth line, and so there, there was a lot of projection of his great success, and he was tremendously successful in in uh, in some ways. I know it greatly pained him that that when he left, he actually did leave a tremendous amount of debt, and it was it was not uh, how how it appeared from the outside. But but I I think he would have been happy to um, to know that his work continues to to bring prosperity to his family, and. Um, that is really beautiful how how our children can sometimes be our greatest teachers. Um, I don't I don't have any children, but I've I've noticed that in the lives of those I know how how much that can really change someone. Um, also, just as a as a side note, it's interesting for me. I um I grew up around a lot of theosophical work, and I was never that interested in it. I knew a lot of theosophers, as I mentioned. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a very collective person. I, I'm, I'm a 2946, 952 personality sun in gate 46. I mean, I'm, I'm very collective. And so I was always interested in, yeah, the archetypes and and, and that sort of thing and, and writing essays. I would, I would actually lecture on Jung. I was a guest lecturer at various institutions and uh, would lecture on alchemy. And I remember having this sort of judgmental bent of, all these people who are taking this stuff too literally, you know, I'm the one that has the intellectual distance from it, kind of a, you know, superiority complex of, of, of the intellectual. And, um, but I ended up being surrounded by theosophical people. And I, I had a good friend who was very involved in the theosophical society and I was always kind of immune to it. And then a couple of years ago, I, I had my own series of interesting experiences of, um, Having never had any interest in past lives and never had any interest in certain things, uh, even having had like Akashic Records readings bought for me and not really gotten much out of them or having been told um, I didn't have past lives or they couldn't access them or things like that, I ended up having a, a very uh, mystical series of experiences where I did become quite astute at actually at actually finding people's past lives and, and working in that in that area. And one of the things that I learned in my research was that Ra Uruhu was, uh, I'll say most likely, but I, I believe he was a man named William Kwan Judge. Judge was one of the founders of the Theosophical Society. So it seems quite um, appropriate that Ra was studying, you know, these you know, charts and kind of in that world, he had a bunch of friends who were into theosophy and so on. But it's also just an interesting uh, point that the Theosophers believe that Osho was um, inspired by or collaborating with, you could say, two ascended masters, Kuthumi and El Moria. And I'd always heard this ascended master talk, and it was a bit, um, kind of made me squirm a little bit, or I just wasn't that interested. But, but once I finally actually dug into it, it became clear to me um, I mean, regardless of what words we use or what ways we understand it, there there absolutely are um, beings who disincarnately work 
work with us. And it, 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 it was compelling to me. I mean, it made sense to me and also why Osho would be um, such an, and, 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 you know, such a figure of helping Western culture in particular overcome their puritanical mores and kind of get out of a lot of their indoctrinated uh, limiting beliefs. And I, I really see, um, I see projects almost that at different times in the evolution of consciousness, there are projects that need to be undertaken. And I was never an insider in any of the work of Osho. I've only read a little bit of his work. I appreciated all of it. He is absolutely brilliant, as you mentioned. But um, as an outsider, it seems to me that that he undertook a, a pretty big project of really helping Western culture move to its next phase of overcoming a lot of shame and a lot of possessiveness and small-mindedness and just a lot of things that had been festering in the Western psyche for, for, for many centuries. So yeah. I definitely see that. He always said he was a hundred years ahead of his time, you know, that people wouldn't really understand him for a hundred years after he'd gone. So yeah, yeah it was, uh, it was a wild ride with him and literally him having to explain to people coming from the West, you know, alternative ways of looking at life and, uh, he talked about every single enlightened religious, scientific, whatever stream that's ever been invented. He talked about all of it. You know, and in the end, he said, really, what I'm talking about here is meditation. He, you know, he was a professor of uh, philosophy in India. One of these guys, when he was a student, you know, never went to the classes. He'd just go to the library and read all the books there. And then when it came time for the finals, you know, the, there'd be all the questions and stuff and he'd leave after 20 minutes and ace the whole thing. And he just had that genius. My favorite story about him was when he was a debating champion in India. You know, this is like golf in America, you know, the top golf players and stuff in India. It's about who's got the best debating skills. So he rolls up at this championship debate and his opponent's not there. So they wait and wait and wait and the opponent doesn't show up. So they said, well, go ahead, do your argument, and then hopefully he'll show up. So Usher goes through his whole argument, you know, point by point by point of how his side of an argument is absolutely the only one he could possibly imagine. Gets the end of it, big round of applause. The opponent is still not there. So Usher says, well, don't worry, I'll cross the floor and argue for him. Crosses the floor and wins for his opponent. So basically, the bottom line here, Jonah, is this was someone that studied deeply into the whole thought process of logic, theology, you know, philosophy, the whole business, could work out every single last lingering thought anywhere. And that's what he put in all his discourses and his books and stuff. And he'd lay out these absolute concrete theoretical pinpoint arguments of why you should consider this to be the only possibility of something and then a week or so later he'd argue the other side of it in his discourse and he'd say you know whatever i was saying the week before was absolute nonsense you know here's where the whole thing goes and so the bottom line of everything that osho did was there's always two sides to a coin there's always two sides to an argument there's always two sides to anything in life what is your point what is your place in all of this? Because all this stuff's collective. Thoughts, belief, ideas, possibilities, whatever. What's your place in life? Because you didn't come here to live somebody else's life. You didn't come here to follow somebody else's religion. You came here to be you. And that was, you know, that was the questions I'd get in early years, you know, when I was reading for people. What's my purpose here? And of course, you know, you can go into somebody's design and say, well, you know, here's your life theme. Here's your destiny path. Here's your son, you know, here's your type of authority, whatever. But it's obvious. It's really obvious what we come here for. Our purpose is to be ourself. In whatever we imagine this thing to be going on around us. And what my enlightened reflective friend says, you know, when you look at a human design chart, what you're looking at is your karma chart. It's all there. The whole thing is there. You live true to that design. You live in that frequency. Game over. 
no issues, no complaints, nothing bothers me anymore. This is me. This is my life. And so really, we have this extraordinary tool in our hands these days. And our whole thing is, can we get out of all the mental, I hate that word strategy applied to human design. So purely mental thing, your strategy. It's like, fuck off, you know, frequency, frequency. That's the whole deal. What's the buzz? You know, is it a resonant buzz or is it a buzz that just distracts you? Are you chasing after somebody else's buzz or are you happy to sit in your own buzz? It's what it all comes down to. So, you know, Ra laid it out beautifully. The projectors that really built the human design system, Zeno and Chaitanya, great work. But what I will say, human design is absolutely in its infancy. You describe kids teaching their parents how to do it. I mean, you wait until those kids have grown up a little bit more and then their kids start telling them how to do it, you know? We're right in the infancy, Jonah. It's a, you know, and we've had this privilege of being right at the beginning of it. And it's amazing. And That's I don't know about cool. theosophy. I don't know about these other societies and stuff like that. What I do know is that Osho set the tempo for the Aquarian age. We're coming out of the Piscean age where it's everybody else's fault. You know, the blame, shame, guilt game, whether you go to church or whether it's politics or whatever it is, all that stuff. All these politicians and people, they're going to diminish in this next 20, 30 years. There's going to be no place for it. They can go back to being civil servants. And as for people running the church, I mean, I look at this Francis guy in the Vatican at the moment, all his cardinals, they're looking kind of nervous. You know, this guy is taking away our job security. Well, you make you make some wonderful points, and I, I I have a little something to share that that might uh, might make you chuckle. So you know, I, I I never really I don't even talk that much about past lives now because it's such um, a topic that can just kind of run away and carry people can get swept away in in that. But when I became aware of that dynamic. And it's something that also, I mean, I, I remember Ra talking about how he had his past life recall and kind of refused to really talk about it because at a certain point you have to just leave it as it is. But it was something that became interesting to me because I, I would say there were only really two, two incredible moments in my life of um, things that were just so impossible to believe, but were, were so real. And the first was coming into the human design system where it took me well, as I mentioned, I was introduced to it in 2006. It wasn't until 2015 that I actually had a reading from a reflector who really transmitted some imprint to me. And then it was about nine months after that, almost like a gestation period, that I then had uh, my own seven or eight day mystical experience. There was no voice involved, but I certainly right. had a, a, a sacral awakening and it certainly... Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I all all thought stopped. It went into the background, and I I entered into a place where thought would only arise in response to someone talking to me, and then when they were gone, it was gone, and nothing replaced it. And periodically, it would come back because something would bump into it, so to speak, and I would have this horror of, but what if I'm actually an evil person? And and the panic, but then the panic would just would go away with. It was, it was a very blissful experience overall, but but in any case, um, that was the first thing that really transformed my my life in terms of of just something so unbelievable that didn't require belief. It's like this is unbelievable. That's okay. I don't have to believe it. It's just right. I can just move on now. But then right. the second one was, and this is after I'd had I'd had no interest in past lives, and I'd had a girlfriend buy me past life readings. And they said they, I didn't have any, couldn't access them, this and that. And then I ended up having this, this pretty profound and very difficulty, very, very difficult, very troubling experience. Um, although I pretty much just accepted it a, as each moment came, but I ended up having a first past life recall of my most recent life. And then the one before that, and the one before that, and on and on uh, for quite a few of them. And around that time, I began to be able to pick out certain, I, I began to notice that things I had already seen in other people were actually related to their past lives and find some past lives. 
And the interesting thing is there were there were some uh, there were some pretty notable people. And in one case, this is what might make you chuckle. So I arrived at a past life for a, a friend of mine. Um, and it was it was kind of hard to believe, but not that hard to believe when you realize how small the world really is. It was the the poet Rilke. And I arrived at this, but I didn't tell him because I didn't think it's he has any need, need to know. And I don't want to talk about people. You don't want to just tell somebody they were someone famous and this and that. You don't want to you don't want to spook them. But it seemed pretty clear to me he was he was Rilke. And then what ended up happening was um, a, a, another mutual friend of ours a year later, just just a few months ago or a month ago, actually at the High Desert Human Design Conference, she said, you know, I really think our friend, our friend William, I think he's the reincarnation of Rilke. And we were kind of laughing about it. And so I, I ended up getting up the nerve to, to tell him. I finally told him. And of course, he already knew. This is what most people <laughs> actually said. So, you know, I think you might have been this famous poet. And he said, oh, is it Rilke? And I'm like, oh, my God, you know. And of course, there's all these coincidences, coincidences like, like he was born in the same place and he went by Wilhelm. And then I found out that was one of Rilke's middle names. And, you know, he had this 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 kind of inexplicable infuriation with all the translations of Rilke because they never get it right and all this different stuff. So then we started talking, though, and he says, but you know what's funny, Jonah? He said, uh, I'm just a typewriter poet at the market. I mean, I just travel from place to place with my typewriter and I write poems for people one at a time. I've probably written 50,000. But Rilke was celebrated in, in college lecture halls and, you know, oh, how the mighty have fallen. And I just said, that's not the age we're in anymore because you touched people, but they all worshipped you and shared in their worship as Rilke. Now he's pretty much anonymous, but he's a man sitting with a typewriter at the market by donation. He'll write a poem for you and people regularly weep their eyes out at the poems he gives them. So it's just such a nice little moment of how the era we are in is one on one. We are in the era of the connection. And it sounds like even though Osho had quite a following, it was very intimate and it was very personal. And he was talking as a person to another person. So I just thought you might enjoy that as just, just an yeah. example of the, the movement of life of how we're in this new, new age. Yeah. Well, one has to be really careful about this stuff. Um, you were fortunate in that there was a clear resonance. Osho in his company drew pretty much anyone to him and Hitler was there. Yeah. And I was actually friends with her. Wow. 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 Yeah. And, you know, when I had that realization, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, what am I supposed to do now in the friendship now that I have this knowledge? And I was taken back to a time, you know, I told you I used to drive these buses backwards and forwards from London to Kathmandu. There was this one time between trips, I was in Kathmandu, and I'd made friends with this Swiss couple. And we decided we'd have dinner together. So we're in this little restaurant in Kathmandu, and it's a full moon night. And we're halfway through our dinner, and we realize there's this guy standing in the doorway. And he knows these two people. And he's a sadhu, you know, one of these guys that wears the orange robe and carries a stick and a begging bowl, but he didn't have his begging bowl. Anyway, he was there and we invited him, come on, come in, come and join us. And he comes in and has a cup of tea with us. And he launches into this whole discussion with these two people about past lives. And they're going on and on and on. I'm sitting there opposite and it's like, this is amazing. And he's seeing all this stuff and it's like, yeah. yeah. But I get a little fed up. I said, well, you know, you're telling these guys everything. How about me? You're going to tell me something? And he turns to me and he says, full moon birthday. And turns back to these people again. And it's true. I was born on a full moon. It was a full moon night. I was obviously, you know, shining as one does. And uh, back again. He's talking with these two again. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. It's like, uh, hang on a minute, you know, there's somebody else sitting at the table here. I said, can't you tell me anything about my lifetimes? And he turns to me, looks me in the eye and says, there are many lifetimes, Baba. This lifetime is the most important. Mm. And I don't doubt for a moment he could tell me all kinds of stories about stuff, but he, he realized this is not something I needed. 
Well, and even beyond not needing, it, it can meddle and it can be, I mean, I, I started to wonder, uh, this is why I don't talk about it much. I only brought it up here because it's it's just something of a bit of a, I would say it was the second most profound thing that I'd, I'd had happen to me beyond the initial um, experience I mentioned after coming into human design. But yeah, I, I think um, past It's lives, an incredible so, thing. It's an they, incredible thing. Going into other time frames, especially but it's kind of like a it's like a need to know thing when someone is yeah, and I, I think in in the case of my my friend, it was only because it triangulated from multiple angles and it kind of came up that way, and I, I do think it it helped him to have a little um, a little a little nudge in that way. But I, I I almost think it's harmful to tell someone their past lives because it it's not it's not really for it's not to be told. It's something that will either come or it won't, and it'll either be important for you or it won't. There'll either be something unresolved that you can't work through that needs to be resolved, or maybe it works through on its own w without that. And and so um, it's definitely not something that I, uh, I I bring up regularly, although I have wanted to create my own secret society simply to discuss these things. <laughs> um, and it yeah, did... It, uh, it, yeah, it gave me a, a different perspective on on history when I started to to realize, and also just the redemption of no matter how bad someone has been by whichever standards or or what they've done, that um, we are on some sort of path, and it's it can be called levels of initiation, it can be called levels of ascension or enlightenment or anything else, but but that there is a path, and um, that was very comforting to me. So, yeah, no, I've, I've had, um, I've had my own interesting journey filled with, with synchronicity, I guess, as you would expect for a personality sign in gate 46, a lot of serendipity in my life. One of the interesting things that, that happened for me is that I moved to Santa Fe without really knowing why. Actually, it was about a week or two after I met you. I came here kind of on a whim because it just captivated me and I had never really traveled a great deal. I'd lived in, in Seattle for 25 years. I was born in Boston. I was always accustomed to cities. And I came to this ancient cow town in the Southwest. And uh, I, mean, I live on a dirt road. And it was interesting to me because I, I was drawn here. And then I, I also really wanted to buy a, a home. I never bought a house before. And so I spent the next year or more looking. And I looked at hundreds of places. And of course, it was a question of sacral response. And I went to all these mountain homes, I'm mountain environment, and I thought for sure I would have this sacral response there. But then my you know, realtor would say, do you want this place? I'd go, uh, no, I don't know if I can, this doesn't feel right or something. And I ended up getting almost a valley place, which again shows that the mind can't really <laughs> know what you're going to want. But I ended up getting this place uh, next to, to Frenchie's Field here in Santa Fe, which is a big field I would later find out the the local mystics and channels and people believe that it's um, the spiritual center of Santa Fe and that it's actually etherically where the temple at Luxor and Egypt moved to and all of this stuff. I had no idea of any of that when I moved here. It's all nice stories for the for the abstract people out there. It's story time. But uh, but anyway, I moved here and I found this this wonderful home and I've I've actually established the home. I, I've called it the Center for Human Design and. So far, I haven't been blacklisted that I know of by anybody. I do think the 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 blacklisting is, uh, you know, I, I would just say I, I think it's a badge of of pride if anyone if anyone has. I haven't heard of you being blacklisted, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. If I if anyone has, it's a it's a badge of pride. But um, yeah, you can yeah, see the early comments on the book, you know, on Amazon. Was kind well, of fun. Okay, well, I haven't read those, but you know, that's more collective stuff, you know. So so, uh, yeah. but anyway, I ended up moving here. And I, I bought this home, my first home, and I called it the Center for Human Design. It's actually registered on Google Maps as a spiritist organization, and we have a sign and everything. And it's been really nice. And I started to throw these, these conferences, the, the High Desert Human Design Conference, with my good friend for many years who moved here independently. You know, I moved here as a stranger. I'm a 5-1. I didn't know a soul in Santa Fe. And I just found this place and kind of set up shop. And I later found out that Genoa Bliven the head of Human Design America and his partner, Lucita, live a stone's throw away right across Santa Fe River, literally 
adjacent to Frenchie's field where I am. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying like euphemistically a couple blocks away, like literally a couple blocks away. And we just both are in the same place and we've actually become good friends. And I, I'm, I'm really, really happy to say that they are, are really lovely people. And I've gotten a lot of, uh, and then also just the incredible interconnections between our lives uh, it's the same kind of thing as with past lives. I mean, you know, you don't even have to look at past lives. Just look at your present life, the amount of interconnections with other people and how intertwined our lives are. It, it makes the world feel a lot smaller. And on the one hand, there are 8 billion people. On the other hand, our fractal families or however we want to call them are so tightly knit that we somehow find ourselves in the masses. It's kind of like being in, you know, New York City and you see your friend in Times Square, you know, what are the chances that it happens? So it was an interesting experience for me. And then um, being involved in the High Desert Human Design Conference, which has really just been a, a complete labor of love. I mean, I, I, I'm a generator, so I'm not here to initiate things. So it's been interesting. I get asked a lot, well, how did you start this then? How did you make this conference? And I think that's a little bit too literal. I mean, I built it and I built it every step of the way uh, with blood, sweat, and tears of the creative impulse and honoring the creative impulse. And I know the moment I start having fear and a sense of obligation and how do I live up to the expectations and all of these things that I've taken a misstep and I need to take a step back and I need to get back in line with, with what is that creative impulse? Because for me as a generator, it is creative. And I'm a gate 46 personality son. So people are always locking me into patterns and trying to get me to commit to some repetition. And I'm always moving on. People are saying, last year was perfect. Do it just like that next year. And I say, I'll never do it the same way next year. You know, I want years from now people to be able to say, oh, were you there in 2024 when they had fire dancers? And, and the, you know, I, I don't know what, but but for me, it's it's quite a, it's quite an experiential thing. So I, uh, I hope someday you will, you will join if you feel inclined and uh, you would, you would always, you're always welcome uh, in any endeavors I take part in, whether it's events or, or otherwise, because. You know, uh, I talked earlier about my reflector friend looking at a human design chart and saying, this is your karma chart, right? It's all there, the whole thing. And about you know, I've read for over 10,000 people over the years, all over the world. And I've got this knack now of being able to tune into what level of consciousness to approach this person, you know, where they are, do they need the ABCs or can they go a little bit higher with it? You know, get into another frequency with it all, like really see where the transformation takes place. And about four years ago, I started doing what I call karma clearing. And the first one I did was uh, love karma, because all of us have these inbuilt patterns of what has been passed down to us genetically of how we interact in this universe of love. And it comes down to, you know, we've got one hexagram and one line. It's our unconscious Venus. And so it's like a little crack in the doorway through which one can give and receive love. And all of us have this. It's baked into the design. So, you know, if you don't know what this is and you don't know how to get it and how to embrace it, you know, then you're stuck with it. And it's one disaster after another or, you know, definitely limited love experiences. However, when you get it, all of a sudden you get all 384 lines. You get the whole shooting match. And so I've been doing these workshops where I get people... It's a three-day workshop. Get them into the first day of it. You know, deep meditation, really get into your design, understand how the thing works, you know, share it with somebody else. You know, get really comfortable. And then the second day, we go right into this unconscious Venus thing. Last time I did it, there were about, I don't know, 60 participants. And it was actually in China. And in China, you know, Chinese people have a very strong relationship with their ancestry. And literally we're going into this space together. You know, everyone's got their own little gateway to go in there, but I've talked them in very gently. And all of a sudden the room is full of all the feminine ancestors. The mothers, the grandmothers, the great grandmothers, all the way back. And it's like, 
everybody is bathed in this feminine energy of love, of all the misunderstandings, all the hardships, all the difficulties, whatever. And the ancestors all kind of saying, well, look, it's up to you now. Can you get this? Can we support you? Can you recognize, you know, what you represent to us? It was one of the most amazing experiences to have happen. So I've been doing these sessions privately. The COVID kind of stopped me being able to do it on large. But I'm doing it again this next year. I'm going to take people into these spaces. They're quite incredible. What are the feedback I got afterwards as well? It's like, wow, my life is something completely different now. And then I started doing another round, which I call the destiny path. You know, we talked about nodes a little bit. And, you know, the destiny path is the nodes, the south to the north node, which, you know, you think, well, what are these things? You know, they're little points in space where there's an interaction with the orbits of the sun and the moon. You know, there's no planet there or anything kind of, but it is a point in time and space. And they definitely point towards our journey here. You know, we human design was a little simplistic saying, you know, you're in a midpoint and all of a sudden you shift to the other one. It's not like you leave the first part behind. It's like that stays with you. But it's it's recognizing whatever the first part is, is the exact opposite energetically of the second part. You know, we're traversing the wheel. We're going from yin to yang or yang to yin or whatever. And so, you know, opposites complement. And so that is the second one I do is this destiny path clearing. And I've come out of workshops with this where people have just said to me, you know, within two days, I had my whole book, chapter, everything clear, beginning, middle, end, the whole thing. I got my website absolutely as I want it. You know, I totally rearranged my living situation. It's almost like, you know, the, this karma clearing can literally take away lead weights. Mm. And it's in the human design. It's in the chart. It's just a case of knowing which parts of it to access. And of course, to be held in a space where you can go into that experience and really have it very profoundly. So as I say, you know, human design is absolutely in its infancy. You know, there's so many chapters, so many places to open up. And, uh, you know, I have to use the words no choice. You know, I never like that. To me, life is a mystery. I just work on that basis. Life is a miracle, a mystery, you know. I, I trained as a mechanical engineer. I do not see life as a mechanical machine. I And I could tell you a whole story about how I came to that conclusion, but it's, we are open to miracle here. And I've watched it over and over and over again. Living around Osho was like a daily occurrence. It was just, you know, watching the impossible. And um, we have an amazing tool in our hands with this human design. And... I was literally told, you know, my job was to put it out to the whole world. I had no idea what the guy was talking about in 1979. No idea at all. It's like, that was a very interesting reading I just had, but it just happened and it came about. So just, you know, to anyone that listens to your frequencies, you know, this is all about frequencies. Human design, life is all about frequencies. Who invented this outfit, you know, this human body outfit? Who invented this thing, you know? And it's got this magnetic monopole in it. I mean, please. And the design crystal is sitting there somewhere or other. I mean, you know, finally, we can actually understand how this thing is glued together. Mm -hmm. Because you ask a physicist what's here, it's a bunch of light particles bouncing around, you know, and yet it contains us to have this experience. You know, I talked earlier about the, Starfield, the planet, the genetic codon. When the whole possibility of having a life experience in 3D happened, and it was a lot longer ago than Sumerian times, I'll tell you. You know, that's just recent recorded history. This thing's been going on for a long time. And it's really where it crux at this moment in time to do something very differently. But in those times, you know, it was like, hey, how about a how about a go around in 3D? How would that be? Oh, great. You know, count me in. How many years have I got? Well, you know, you could do 100, maybe 900. If you're like Abraham, you want to stick around for a bit, you know. And then you're done. Off you go, you know. But what happened is, I don't know what, you know, what the progress of it was, but our little planetary system here kind of moves into a darker part of the universe. And all of a sudden, instead of being able to jump out and go off into some other dimension somewhere, we started grabbing on to and identifying with the genetics. 
and we started becoming you said you know the whole thing of spirit being dismissed you know we started thinking this is all a material deal and you know what happens is you get in a material deal all of a sudden you start generating more and more karma and you keep having to come back and you have you know do not pass go do not complete anything and so you know there really is some magic in this thing of letting go of stuff we don't need to hold on to anymore and i just have to say you were kind enough to invite me to have this talk with you today and I just want to let everyone know, you know, do not stop with human design. It's not just, you know, type authority profile variables, whatever. It's not this stuff. It's way bigger than this. And just, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, very much well said. And I mean, um, not only am I inviting you to be a guest anytime you'd like here, but um, anything I, I take part in, I mean, um, I do the human design, you know, event here, but I I also am involved in some other things as well. And so, you know, consider it. Uh, I I know sometimes people say an invitation should be specific and it should be this and it should be that. I believe in the age of the bard, where if you're recognized as a bard, then you always have a meal and a place to stay and and a, you know welcome group of people who are are more than happy to see you. And um, so I, I think it's safe to say you have that in. Santa Fe. And uh, actually for about five years now, we've been doing a, a weekly Monday night event we call Human Design Catalyst. I'm actually going to going to get ready for that after our our uh, discussion here. But um, it's been really right. lovely for me to kind of see how, what, what people come in, like, like you were saying with, with Osho, where you had more nations represented than the UN. It's yeah. incredible to me to see the kind of people that come into human design and get interested in it and, and who's actually drawn to it um, and some of the things they, they bring to it as well. And I, I absolutely echo the sentiment that it is that, that life is bigger than just the formulas that we are given. We have some incredible formulas that Ra came up with. We have some incredible information that he accessed and presented. And those formulas are meant to be, filled in with lived life and developed uh, your work on on karma clearing on destiny clearing love karma these things i mean that's that's incredible to me um I, i'll mention and I, i'm not sure how much time you have so if you have any any restriction please let me know we will we will wrap up but um i was going to say something that that i found myself you know i, I it's so interesting how how things go in these in these loops where i was probably 14 years old when i first got a Florence Campbell love cards, destiny cards kind of book. And I thought, oh, this is some fascinating, interesting, almost like a parlor game. And then it was only a, a couple of years ago um, through some, some folks I'd met in human design that I began studying the cards of destiny, also called cards of the Magi, playing card. It's a playing card system. And it seems so frivolous, like what would playing cards have to do with anything profound? You know, this is a parlor game or something like that. But then when I looked into it, I, I learned, I mean, there are some, there are some incredible mathematics um, encoded in just a regular deck of playing cards. I mean, beyond 52 cards, 52 weeks, you can add up every card in the deck and it, it comes to 364, add the joker, you have 365, all these interesting mathematical properties and uh it's it's also i kind of put it in the same category of past lives where it's not something that most people need to know and it's not going to the knowledge is not going to set you free you're not going to learn your your card but at this you know and have some sort of profound experience per se but it has allowed me some interesting insights and I, i've realized why i i still engage in these other interests is is partly so that I can better get rid of the biases I might even have and the assumptions I might have from looking at a human design body graph. Because since my understanding of past lives, I no longer assume that I know much about the person from their body graph. I might know about their karma, like you're saying. I love that, that the body graph shows the karma. I might know certain characteristics, certain commonalities, but there was a period where I kind of briefly assumed I knew someone from the body graph, you know, where I, I kind of, you know, you, you go through like kind of testing your footing and then going, and, and of course it is true. We can tell people things that can be so helpful to them and it can be so incredible to them. But, but it's really, I guess what I'm saying is 
two people born in the exact same time, they might have the exact same karma even, but how they handle it and how they live it and how they surrender to it or resist it, it's it's helped me disentangle that. And it's it's the same with the cards. It's been so interesting to look at things that that the cards show you. And my favorite part of it is um, that when you get really deep into the cards of the Magi or cards of destiny, you get different spreads for each year. And it's one of those things where I finally just had to to stop looking into it because it, it's something that could be consuming. You know, it's something that you're like, okay, I guess this is real. I guess like I, I got to the point where is this real? Could this have value? And then I, I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is actually what, uh, this is what Ra asked the voice about. He asked the voice about very little. I mean, he basically kept his mouth shut that whole experience. But in his own words, he asked the voice about the cards. And I guess he was talking about tarot cards, but it's basically the same thing, the minor arcana. And he asked the voice about the tarot cards and why it wasn't included. I think he also asked about runes. I think the tarot cards and the runes were the only two sort of mystical systems that he wasn't able to to integrate into in the human design. But what the voice said was that the cards had to do with sequencing, incarnation sequencing, and also sequencing within one's life. And so it became clear to me from my study of the cards that there are, are deeply encoded sequences that play out. And I, I still can't say it's only no choice. I mean, I know such a core Tenet of human design is no choice. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, how do we interpret that? Because it's obvious to me that there are certain incredible miracles, like, like um, a reader who can tell you your thousand past lives and your thousand future lives or something like that. At the same time, I see it's almost like Tetris blocks falling and we're trying to fit them in and we're maneuvering around them as they come or something. There's, there's a certain, um, or I, I would even put it a different way that, our awareness is the only thing that really changes, but as it changes, the things that, the lessons that we keep learning, once we've learned them, we don't have to learn them anymore. And so invisibly, imperceptibly, the trajectory of our life is constantly being adjusted, depending on whether we learn or we don't, depending on whether we have empathy or we have fear, depending on whether we open ourselves up or close ourselves down. And there, I mean, there's like, there's something about, there is some sort of, I mean, it is a mystery to me as well. I, I don't, I don't claim to have a, a formulated thesis of, uh, of how it all works, but, but it's been really beautiful for me to, to have human design, to navigate my own decision-making while journeying and venturing into these far reaching waters of other mystical systems, even if just to to have a sense of wonder i have nine first lines so i have a lot of wonder in my chart as well um about about the the mysteries of the world so it's been really lovely for me and and i, I guess which is just to say that uh that the kinds of areas of research you're going into and not even research but the the practical applications you found of actually working with people directly um on on improving their lives through direct action of, of the awareness on, on their karmas. I mean, once you bring awareness to something, it changes it or it, or it changes you. And it's not the same anymore. Well, Ra came out with the phrase, no choice. Uh, Osho used to talk in terms of choiceless awareness. Mm. And it's, you know, it's a more on point, you know, I always felt a lot of the things that came through Ra were kind of, um, I wouldn't say demeaning, but they, they, you know, there was a little bit of a put down involved in it until he started getting really confident in himself. The thing about playing cards, you know, something that is in every household, every family, every everywhere, forever. You know, the church was absolutely brutal, brutal in beating up on people that were doing mystical works. You know, wise women, witches, and stuff burned at the stake because they could actually tap into something that was not part of Jesus Christ or Muhammad or anything like that. You know, the church was absolutely horrific in its behaviors for the last 2,500 years, you know, but we are now at light speed moving out of the Piscean Age. And the Piscean Age, when you look at it, it is all about somebody else's fault. The blame game. You know, I can't do this because of that. My parents screwed me up. My teachers screwed me up. You know, the politicians are all against me. The church says I can't do this, that, and the other. You know, 
So you start off with the boss, you know, your parents, then it's your boss, then it's your your wife or your husband or whatever, then it's your landlord, and then it's the president, and then it's God, you know, the pecking order. Yeah. In the end, you know, it's like, hang on a minute. This is your life. Get a grip, you know? And that's our great game here, Jonah, is, is reminding people what they came here for. They came here to be themselves. You know, does anyone know better about you than yourself? Anyone else in your skin? No. Get a grip, you know, get on with it and have an amazing time with it. And honestly, you know, coming out of the Dark Ages, we're not that far from the Dark Ages. Men didn't, in my evaluation, men didn't start having feelings until the 1970s. You know, it was only women that had feelings before that. You know, it was all their fault. And slowly, slowly we're coming out now. We thank God, you know, Mother Earth and we're, you know, some very, very amazing women standing forth and, you know, just telling us, you know, we've been eliminated for so long. I spent a lot of time in the Muslim world, you know, where women walk around in tents, you know, you can't see them. And it's it's an extraordinary thing. And I, you know, I'm not about to try and change that whole way of life, but it has to change. We're moving into the Aquarian age, you know, the waves, as above, so below. You want heaven? Then live it. Beautifully, beautifully said. You're speaking to my alchemical heart. So <laughs> yeah, my, my one of my first great loves. I, I was a teenager studying alchemy and um and 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 the work of Carl Jung and all of that. So well, I have the sense that we could talk at length about any other number of topics, but uh I, I'm so happy just to what we've talked about here, and I'm happy hearing what you're up to. I, I really um had not uh been in the loop on some of the things you're doing and so are you so you said you're about to be offering more work soon now is this is this online do you do in person is it no, it's totally in person it's totally okay in person. Yeah, it's yeah. very profound very deep and very, I, you know it's like holding somebody's hand energetically and just being there with them holding space and mm -hmm. um letting people have that really extraordinary experience with themselves and you know a lot of their stories. <laughs> well, wonderful, wonderful. I, I'm really um, interested in that. And yeah, I, I can absolutely speak to, um, I mean, I, I appreciate online because we can have conversations like this, but from throwing these, uh, you know, human design events, I, I found that there's really no substitute and the to being in person and the the actual Frequency. I mean, certainly we convey frequency through our tone of voice and certain things that we can we can do. But being in person, it's it's so different, and there is something um, really profound about about just experiencing that. It, it, it's it's uh, transformative. I mean, I, I've each year of this of our High Desert Human Design Conference has been so unique, and I keep kind of thinking I have my finger on it, and then the next one happens. And then it's completely different again. <laughs> and so you kind of start, go back to the beginning. It's it's a new experience and it's, it's a new dynamic. So well, we'll see, you're yeah. a different person. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, this has been so wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get, uh, I, I just want to say thanks again for, for being a guest. And I would, uh, I would love to meet in person again. I had such a great time meeting you those years ago. So I, I hope we do meet again in person and um maybe in new york city who knows <laughs> yeah oh is that is that where is that where you'll no, be no, I was just, you oh, oh because of the times square yeah <laughs> it'll be it'll be new year's eve we'll be in a crowd i'll turn and say Jayton, what are you doing here and you'll say what are you doing here how did you get here yeah very good wonderful wonderful well thank Lovely. you so much well, for the invitation jonah all the best and we'll talk again sometime soon okay that sounds wonderful okay all thank right. you so much all right bye, -bye. Thank you.